history of the past with current events for today. And today we've got a really exciting episode and we're going to pick up where we left off um, after last week covering really the end of World War II and the Chinese Civil War. And there's a fundamental uh, question that we are going to try and answer the best we can. And that's, did the U.S. lose China? And that's a really important question because it's been asked since 1950. Um, Jay, I'd be really interested just to dive right in and get your thoughts on it. I mean, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, so... Just to continue the narrative for our listeners that have been following along in our uh, U.S.-China relations story is we finished our last episode with uh, the conclusion of World War II the, or the end of the Second Sino-Japanese War. Well, if you've been following along, we know that the nationalists and the communists hate one another <laughs> and – like the civil war that was occurring prior to World War II didn't really stop, even though there was this second united front. And the U.S. was trying to navigate like, ah, we're at war with Japan, so we're friendly with China. We're really friendly with Chiang Kai-shek, but there's Mao and the Chinese Communist Party or the CCP. Maybe we should be friends with them, etc. So... After World War II, there was the the reignition of the Chinese Civil War, and you know, new, uh, newsflash: the communists are in control of China. <laughs> well, that's that's a that's a great two minute or less synopsis of those uh, of those what six years. But so, Jay, did did we lose China? Did the U.S. lose China? Yeah, that's a that's a. A good question because we, the United States, this is such an American question to ask. Did the U.S., quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes, lose China? This question, like it's been, it's been criticized in the last like 20 years because by some Chinese scholars, <laughs> interestingly enough, because it's like, wait a minute, you never had China to begin with, but to help like understand why the United States even asks itself this question is we like look at the rest of U S history after 1950, the Korean war kicks off around this time, Vietnam. We are this, this event laid the foundation for an American belief that Communism was on the rise globally, and the only country that could stem its this rising tide was the United States. And the areas that became communist were necessarily failures on behalf of the United States. Mm. So, like, go ahead. I was going to say that's a that's a really good way to put it. I mean, it's I liked what they said the that China was never the U.S.'s to begin with. So it, it almost washes the U.S. responsibility. It's like, hey, we, we've been a we've been a nation and a people for 5,000 years. Like we have a much longer history than the United States. However, um, the U.S. did play a pretty integral part in this, this time period. And I, I think that we, we vested so many resources and so much – of our foreign policy was at stake in China. It's really the first time we were kind of experimenting, if you will. We didn't have yeah. containment at the time. You know, that was the big push in Korea. It was containment. We've got to contain communism. It's on the it's on the rise. That was the whole point of getting in uh, it involved in Korea and Vietnam and then trying to stop the Russians in Afghanistan in the 80s was we need to contain it. We didn't really have that. We were trying to win here. Right. So no, let's let's talk about Afghanistan real quick. Just to help everyone kind of cage their brain on what what it felt like. I'm a feeling thinker. I don't know what Myers-Briggs <laughs> think that is. I'm a feeler thinker. <laughs> like what it feels like to be in American discourse in 1950 during this time. And I would venture, I was not alive during 1950, <laughs> I would venture that it felt almost identical to August, September 2021 when, when the Taliban took control of Afghanistan again 
the United States was looking at itself going, what the freak just happened? We've lost, again, more air quotes here, we've lost Afghanistan. How did this happen? And of course, in the political discourse, you see, oh, the Democrats have really punted in the stands this time. Uh, They've lost, we've allowed the Taliban to take control of Afghanistan. This is literally in 1950. This is when we say, when the United States was asking itself the question, did we lose China? How did we lose China? It's the same thing. The communist had taken over in 1949. The uh, the Democratic Republic of China was proclaimed by Mao Zedong in Beijing. And the United States is asking itself the question, we lost China. How did this happen? The Democrats, <laughs> interestingly enough, the Democrats lost China again. <laughs> Old Truman, he sucks. So that's interesting. Did they... Uh... Do you think it's kind of looked at as this binary, like, yes, we want it, or yes, if we're to blame, or no, we're not to blame? Yes. And there, those positions are by party lines. So, Colin, I think you've referenced positions here. So, in the, in the debate on did the U.S. lose China, there are three main positions. At the time, in 1950, there were two, and they were exclusively along Republican and Democrat party lines. The first position, and kind of the initiation of this entire debate, was the Republican position. You had guys like Joe McCarthy, who was a big one. You had guys like Kafkoff Douglas MacArthur, who at this point in time, uh, the whole like Korea debacle was not a thing. But if you know anything about MacArthur, he was always a Republican Party um, presidential hopeful. He was sharply critical, uh, especially later, once things really kind of went off the rails between him and Truman very sharply critical of Marshall on how this whole George Marshall, uh, who later became the Secretary of State under Truman, very critical. Anyway, this Republican position was the United States has lost China and it's all the Democrats' fault. It's the incompetency of the Roosevelt and Truman administration, Dean Acheson and the State Department. He is an idiot. It's all his fault. Uh, George Marshall before Acheson, they lost China to the communists. That was the first position. Second position was essentially just the Democrats playing defense. Like, it's not our fault. It's it's Chiang Kai-shek's fault. (laughs) And now we have the introduction of this theory that Chiang Kai-shek was an idiot um, and he was incompetent. And it's... It's the KMT's fault for losing China. And real, real quick, the third position was no. It's neither of those things. It was the Chinese people wanted communism, and Mao just successfully got the will of the people. And by the way, you're asking the wrong question because U.S. you never own China. That's kind of like the three positions in the debate here. Hmm. I don't know. Is there a fourth position where we can combine all three of them into into one? I tend to look at these as a very complex issue, and there's elements of each of them that kind of I don't know support a different uh, support the outcome. If that makes sense, like let's look at position. Let's look at position one. So you know, we talk about the incompetence of Dean Acheson and uh, John S. Service. There was a, an element of incompetence, maybe not incompetence, but you know there were times where they, when they were uh, in the Dixie mission, where they really viewed the CCP as uh, agrarian revolutionaries. They're like they're not real, com- they're not the real communists. They're not the Soviets. We don't have to worry about them. They're actually pretty good, and they somewhat sympathized with them. And I think they underestimated the the threat that Mao was, um, and then that led into what I think were probably some. Um, less than um, honest negotiations during the double 10 agreement that happened right after the, after world war two. So I kind of look at this and maybe it's not true incompetence, but it's just looking, they were naive. And I think they were naive to think that um, the CCP was not as big of a threat and they could really have this peaceable solution. And I think it was um, 
just to, to, to show the, the naive, the naivete, the, yeah. the ignorance or well, the ignorance yeah. of American naive, understanding of China. The naivety. Na- <laughs> God, it's, it's a little bit of the Southern coming out in me. Um, general, general Pat Hurley, Patrick Hurley, he tried to compare the CCP and the KMT to Democrats and Republicans in Oklahoma. Yeah. And I could just imagine him in his accent saying, ain't no different than Democrats and Republicans. In Oklahoma. <laughs> it's a very nothing naive statement. Be, <laughs> nothing could be further from the truth. And that that's kind of my point. Like they don't, they're not looking at this through the lens of there's a century of humiliation that just occurred. And the, the we are sitting on a tinderbox ready for a very, very communist takeover. Yeah. And they had already been killing each other, like for years. Uh, this was Since not 1927, a, if you remember, 1927. There is, yeah, there's no. Was that when the Shanghai massacre was? That is when it occurred. Yeah, yeah. There's no Republican Democrat equivalent <laughs> to the Shanghai maybe the, massacre. Maybe the Civil War, but that that happened like a hundred and what, hundred and sixty years ago. At this point, yeah. Even even then, like. There, like, there, the the U.S. Civil War was not like, oh, I'm a Republican and I'm killing Democrats. Like, there was a larger identity. Like, I think Americans still pretty like people talk about the Second Civil War and it drives me freaking nuts. But like, even then, let's just let's just assume in this stupid theory. <laughs> I'm really showing much of your opinion here <laughs> that this even occurred. Let's it would not be second. it would not be, oh, I'm a Republican. And I'm as a matter of fact, the people who even talk in that phrase, they don't even like being called Republicans. They're largely dissatisfied with the current Republican Party. <laughs> so like it wouldn't be like, I'm a Republican and I want to kill Democrats. That whereas in this point in time, it was like are you a member of the CCP? If yes, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and and the other way around, by the way. Are you a member of the KMT? So I, I've kind of already given my opinion on position one that I think it's incomplete and it it's not it it's partially to blame. But then like that you what you said kind of gets into position number two. Was it the incompetence of Shanghai Shek? No, because I don't even think he realized I mean This is what he, we've already talked at length that he was fighting against the Jap, he had the Japanese to worry about. Then he had the Russians or the Soviets to worry about toward the end of World War II. And then he's got the CCP that he's dealing with. And the the hearts and minds battle that we talked about before, um, imagine you're a peasant in China and you live on this farm, you pay rent to this landowner, whomever, You've been doing that for generations. Your great grandparents lived under this incompetent Qing dynasty that was constantly being exploited. You've been poor this whole time. You've had relatives die in these natural disasters and other rebellions like the Taiping and the Boxer Rebellion. Oh, yeah. then you have to live through warlord eras. Then you have this civil war where you have inflation that is, is now at this point so bad that the money is basically worthless. Right. And some guy comes up to you and says, Hey, the, we're the party of the people. We're going to take the farm that you work and that your family's been working for generations, and we're going to give it back to you. And by the way, your kids can go to school because under that guy Chiang Kai Shek, Shek, he would you didn't have to go fight if you were educated, but you couldn't go be educated. So now we're going to educate mm. your kids. We're going to make them better. And like, of course, they absolutely were going to join the CCP. Right. And here's kind of a statistic of. You know, after the um, the Shanghai massacre, I think they left Shanghai with like thirty to sixty thousand communist soldiers. Yeah. A bunch of them died in the long march. By the end of the Chinese Civil War, I think they had four point three million. Um, yep. So you see, the KMT and the CCP basically just swap. Right. You know, people. So people were leaving. So that that's what he was dealing with. With and. It, you know, that's why he launched like the new life movement. It was a way to try and say like, okay, we're going to try and bring people back to trying to win the hearts and minds. I think that's kind of why he did it. He saw the, the, the decay of his society and was like, I'm going to lose people if if they don't turn it around. Yeah. So, okay. I'm going to try to capture a really complex thought, (laughs) but articulated. I'm not very articulate. This is going to be hard folks. (laughs) 
because what you said, right? Like Mao and the CCP won the civil war because he successfully got the support of the people, right? The, the U S could, if we wanted to prevent that, which I think an argument could be made in 1945, we weren't even trying to prevent that. Um, if we wanted to prevent that, there's no way we could have. There's no feasible option that was available. I mean, we can't even shape U.S. public opinion in that way, much less Chinese public opinion. Like, there's just no way we would have been able to impact that. This is similar. This is the complex thought here. Because <laughs> when you were talking, I immediately thought of Russia. When when the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed, you had Yeltsin in charge of Russia. And all of a sudden, there were like these great democratic aspirations for Russia throughout the 90s, right? And in the year 2000, when Vladimir Putin takes over, uh, yes, folks, Vladimir Putin has been in charge of Russia since – January first, two thousand. Um, Whether as prime president or prime minister, he just he would just swap yeah. roles for a while. <laughs> it, yeah, and and even when he was prime minister, he was absolutely still running that country. Which and you can tell because uh, uh, I'm probably not going to pronounce his name right, but Medvedev, Med Medyev, the guy who was the president <laughs> when Putin was prime minister. Uh, he was absolutely still taking orders from Putin, and even now. He's still taking orders from Putin. So anyway, uh, just look at his Twitter and you can see he's taking orders from Putin. Anyway, uh, there were all these democratic aspirations. And we thought like the Russians, like they've been the Russian people, like they want democracy, etc. The Russian people don't want democracy. They didn't want democracy. The Russian propaganda machine today has very successfully convinced the people, as the Russian people, they do not want democracy. Yes, you'll see demonstrations, you'll see handfuls of people. But one of the most surprising things about this whole Russia Ukraine thing is like the protests have been relatively small. Putin is in power because the Russian people want. Putin in power. In the same way, there was no way in hell the United States could have affected China to prevent Mao from taking over China. Like, there's just, there's no way. We are not able as a country to pick who gets to run it when the it's the people of the country themselves that get to pick who's in charge of the country. That is, okay, so that is, a, you summed it up very well. The people you, want Putin. <laughs> no, I mean, you did. You articulated well. The people wanted the people wanted Putin in Russia. Now they and then they wanted Mao in power. And what I'm going to try and articulate here is, I think Chiang Kai Shek has been um, vindicated over the. You know, recently there's been some scholarship that's come out, and he's been vindicated to a large extent, just being in an impossible situation. So that's why I say mm-hmm. position two. His incompetence. No, he really wasn't incompetent. It was just a, he was in a losing battle. He was going to lose. It it was a matter of time. Position one, I think there was some incompetence. And to your point, the Americans, we were looking at this like, okay, this is a problem that we can solve like we're solving it in America. You said like we can barely shape public policy here. How are we going to shape public policy there? It's not a matter of how many- Public opinion. Public opinion. Excuse me. Public opinion. Of course, we shape public policy. Public opinion. You're right. Um, It's not a matter of how much money, how much aid, how many bullets, how many guns, how much training we provide, how many advisors that we send. It's it's not a matter of that because the KMT took all that and then most of them went and defected and joined the CCP. So it's like we just lost all that. So everything we had given them was just going away. And I say that to say it's very – that's the only matter of incompetence. We thought that we this was an American problem that we could solve like we're solving it here in the US. We'll just give them more aid. Let's just, let's just send them more stuff, more bullets, because then they'll be able to fight longer. 
it wasn't going to happen. And it, it's actually really interesting the way, and we'll get into this in a second, the way that Mao said like, okay, I'm just going to absorb all this and you're just going to have to keep spending, keep doing this. So, so you're right. Yeah, go ahead. I would like to introduce a theme <laughs> that is going to stay with us for the remainder of our U.S.-China relations series. Like we're going to come back to this theme over and over and over again. Because this series is fundamentally about the relationship between U.S. and China, right? I th- we, we've talked a lot about Chinese history uh, because our audience is primarily English-speaking Westerners. Uh, there's obviously some exceptions there. But for English-speaking Westerners, in order to understand the relationship between U.S. and China, we just have to understand China, right? And that t- requires talking about Chinese history, and it's fascinating anyway. But for the remainder of this series, a theme that is going to get brought up over and over and over again is the narrative in the U.S. regarding U.S. and Chinese relations is heavily, if not exclusively, influenced by American party politics. The two sides of the debate are not these within the U.S. on how we should handle China and how we should relate to China um, are not these ethereal academic debates. Rather, they're narrative one and narrative two, narrative A, narrative B. One's the Republican Party narrative and the other one is the Democratic Party uh, narrative. And those define the two sides of the debate. That And that will be true for the rest of the time we're talking about uh, U.S.-Chinese relations. And it, and it comes down to, yes, Republicans and Democrats have two different views of what foreign policy should be. But what we see here and now is that when the communists took over, the Democrats were in charge. And Republicans starting now, well, even before now, but – Really now, like the big red scare in McCarthyism starts time now in 1950. Um, The Republicans will will try to come across as being the anti-communist party, and they will accuse Democrats of being insidious communists, hence McCarthyism, if that makes any sense. Okay, so you just brought up a good point. Red Scare, McCarthyism, like it's Republicans yeah. versus Democrats. Did the framing of this debate get lost in, in all of that? So not only did it get lost, it was completely driven by that. The debate here in the United States was completely driven by that. Uh, and, and Henry Kissinger talks about this on his book on China, kind of kind of chronologically skipping ahead here, what we didn't know at the time was that Mao and the CCP did not get along with the Soviet Union. That that discord started when Stalin died. So Mao and Stalin were buddies. Stalin was supportive of the CCP. When Stalin died and Khrushchev took over, a rift developed and real... I wish we could go into this because communism is fascinating. I do not support communism. (laughs) I am not a communist. Uh, I think communism is a terrible uh, way to organize your society. However, as an American growing up, it was was just like communism bad. And you never really knew why, right? Uh, It was just kind of like – Bad, which it is bad, but but now as time is going on, you learn more. And so that's well, that's what I mean when I say communism is fascinating. Not because I support it. Anyway, <laughs> I need to be clear here. Uh, when Stalin died, Khrushchev, you know, he gave his secret speech when he was uh, to the to the Soviets, and was like, "Yo, Stalin was an idiot. Stalin was terrible." Uh, but they he couched it in these like communistic terms of in within communism there was this phrase called revisionism and and this idea was oh 
maybe Marxist Leninist thought wasn't the best. We need to kind of redo how we do communism. And that was called revisionism. And there was a lot of blame for St- – because Stalin characterized himself within Russian communist thought as the heir of Marxist Leninist thought. Um, anyway, uh, Mao, who was a friend of Stalin, when Khrushchev starts becoming a revisionist and starts criticizing Stalin, Mao was like, no, the Soviet Union has abdicated its role as the vanguard of global communism. I, Chairman Mao, am the, am the next successor of Marxist, Leninist, Stalinist thought. We, China, shall, you know, especially in 1949 after they won the Civil War, we will be the heir of global communism. And whatever nonsense that Khrushchev is doing in the Soviet Union, we don't like it. And the rift developed. We were completely ignorant to this. So when it comes to the Red Scare, we thought, oh, commie, commie, bad. <laughs> like we Russians are commies. Insane. Chinese are commies. They're all bad. They're our enemies. And they must be buddies. And they were not. So, yes, to answer. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, sorry, trying to be more brief. The, yes, things definitely got overtaken by the Red Scare and things got oversimplified because, going back to my other point, we we reduced things to Democrat and Republican narratives and we lost a lot of reality and nuance in the in the situation. Yeah, I think um, it's funny that you say that. Like, or, This is probably more of like the silent generation and baby boomers who would remember it more, but like the only good – the only good commie is a dead comedy, better, yeah. <laughs> better dead than red or things like that, you know, just very catchy things. But I feel like the red scare was overblown to an extent, to an extent, like McCarthy yeah. was almost kind of like, he was kind of like a bloodhound that he, he just sniffed something. So he started barking, but he didn't really know. He just started going everywhere. He, he started attacking everyone everywhere at the same time. If you read, um, was it Stalin's Secret Agents? Great book. Um, we f- we find out that there were a lot of communists that had yep. infiltrated the uh, the Roosevelt administration, probably a lot of other areas too. So there were communists in our ranks. However, for the average American to get riled up about potentially um, being overtaken by communism, it was not going to occur the same way that it happened in China. Like in China. They've endured a century of humiliation. People have been dying for hundreds of years at the boot of what they felt was imperial oppression. Mao talks about it. He he has quite a few quotes about you know the evils of Western imperialism. They use that as a weapon, and people freely went over to come. It wasn't like I think that's the thing we need right. to understand is it's not like the CCP won because they had better tactics, better weapons, better training. They did in a lot of ways. But they would just go to villages and say, hey, do you guys want to join the CCP? Here's what we're about. And that village was like, yep, we want to do that. We're, we'll start a struggle session right now. Let's go to the landowner's house and have a struggle session right now. That would not have happened in the U.S. And for some reason, the U.S. felt that it would. Like It was just like all of a sudden the communists were going to take over the U.S. and we're going to have to live this way. It would not – the, the – um, the circumstances were not the same. The culture was not the same at the time. It just wouldn't have happened. So I think the scare of it was misguided and misdirected, and it cl- it clouded our vision as to what was really going on in China and the Soviet Union and the U.S. as well. I don't know where I was going with that, but that was just a yeah. thought to say that it was misguided the whole time. So I'm going to agree with you a little bit, and I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. <laughs> love, love it. <laughs> I think we I think we're going to agree, but maybe if I could say something I would want to phrase what you just said just a little clarify, bit. Just clarify what I said. I'm thinking <laughs> well, off the cuff. Hey, here. Your opinion's your opinion. I don't wanna I don't feel you know how you know what you're trying to say. <laughs> my my thought is it's I actually don't think McCarthyism was like misguided is not the word that I would use. Because, and this is how this relates to the loss of China, why we're bringing up McCarthyism and the Red Scare with regards to the loss of China. 
McCarthy and others had successfully and truthfully found out that some of the missions, the Dixie, so we're going to talk about the Dixie mission here, uh, that the that the Truman administration was sending to the communists was in fact motivated by communist sympathizers. And we're going to talk about John S. Service here in a second. He was one of them. Uh, communist sympathizers, communist sympathizers in the State Department who were who were giving information to the communists uh, who either were communists or sim- communist sympathizers themselves. And McCarthy and other Republicans were blaming the State Department primarily, but the Truman administration more broadly, for helping the Chinese communists to take over China. That's kind of how McCarthyism and the Red Scare relates to the loss of China. It was like there was a there was an incompet- an incompetence line of effort. I think that's that was primarily directed to George Marshall, who's who became the Secretary of State. But I'm not aware of anybody accusing Marshall of being a communist. Rather, so it Colin, you actually brought this up in an earlier episode. Uh, when we were talking about the history of American politics, when McCarthy gave a speech, when he was like, I have in my hand a list of like some 200 or 240 names of communists in the in the American government. The context of that speech was him talking about the loss of China. So go ahead. Sorry, you look like you were. No, assisting. I was going to say, I'm pretty <laughs> sure he gave that speech to the, the Women's Republic Commit, uh, women's Republican um, organization. I can't remember the, but it was in like Wheeler, West Virginia. It was like a, it was a big deal. I don't, I, you know what? I should clarify. I shouldn't say misguided. It wasn't misguided. He, he was on the trail. I just don't think it ever became fully realized. It became too much of a witch hunt versus a true, but I just feel like it, he, he kind of got off the rails a little bit toward the end and it, he was very close. We know now he was, very right. He just could never really fully flesh it out and stamp it out, if you will. That because I there was what you know, according to Stalin's secret agent, there were like several hundred yes commies yes. in FDR's administration. So Soviet point, agents right. in particular, yeah. So um, it's also interesting. I don't think any of them actually ever really lived in the Soviet Union. They were all like Americans or yeah, um, they were recruited. So they never had to, they never had to live under the boot of communism, but they sympathized with it. Just yeah. So in 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 spy terminology, Russian spy terminology, a either a Russian or like a foreign citizen that would move to the United States and would assume an American persona or at least some kind of some kind of cover persona that it wasn't obvious that they were working for the Russian government. That kind of agent spy is called an illegal. I forget the Russian word for it, but but an illegal uh, is someone who is not native born American. Uh, th- they did it in other countries, by the way. Um, the Great Britain was another big one, uh, and they would move in. So, like, I think it was an Amazon show called The Americans. Yeah, well, it was it was uh, it was FX, but it was like 10 or an years FX years, but, Yeah, it's FX series. Those were illegals, right? That was not the illegals had not penetrated. No, I think some of them were illegals, but that wasn't the majority. The majority of them were just Americans who sympathized with socialism, sympathized with communism, were ideological. Um, ideologically friendly to far leftist politics and they were recruited by either illegals or other people that had been recruited by uh, the Soviets. For McCarthyism in particular, to kind of go back for a second, um, I think because I think McCarthy was a victim of his own success and this is kind of – Today, so when I was in high school, McCarthyism was viewed as a negative. It was viewed as like Joe McCarthy was a bad dude. Witch hunt gets applied. Um, McCarthy was a liar. McCarthy was making stuff up. Um, and honestly, 
all that was true. <laughs> uh, but the the nuance here is the true minute. So I, Colin, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but Eisenhower won the election in 1952. So this is two years, two years prior to the Republicans taking control of the White House. I, I don't I don't recall what the congressional dynamics were at this time, but Republicans were about to take over the White House in 52. Eisenhower campaigned in 52 with Joe McCarthy. Eisenhower did not defend George Marshall when all these charges were being levied against Marshall, who was the Secretary of State underneath Truman. Truman was a Democrat. Um, He didn't defend him. Therefore, Republicans concluded after Eisenhower successfully won the White House, um, and this is after four terms of Democrats. If we were, no, sorry, five, five terms, because Truman finished Roosevelt's fourth term, and then he was independently elected himself. I believe. He, yeah, he was. Uh, if I'm wrong he was pres- no, you're right. He was president for about seven years because if you remember, Roosevelt died. Early in his fourth term, Truman assumed it finished out World War II uh, in 45. And then he was reelected. I think he, was, he came to office in 40, 48. No, 48, 40, yeah. That's not right. And yeah. then, yeah, about 48 finishes out, or he's reelected. And then, um, you know, he loses to, or, and then Eisenhower's elected, excuse me. Right. And the reason why Eisenhower was le- was elected because of his successful narrative that blamed the rise of communism on Truman and the Democrats. So after 52 and even on into the 60s, the Republicans were like, oh, shoot, this is a very successful talking point for us. We're just going to keep it going. <laughs> and the red scare continued to evolve and it took and it took something that was in fact true there were communists in the government the, the there were people who were working for the russians in the in the administration uh and they just kept rolling with it and that's when things kind of spun out of control out of when people started getting made up the quote unquote witch hunts started beginning because they were just trying to continue. McCarthy was a victim of his own success. It's a long way of saying he was a, is a victim of his own success. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. To your point, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so I do want to bring it back to to some of the events that occurred and why there's some criticism. You mentioned, um, you know, these names that were involved. John S. Service has been brought up. Some of the incompetency, and I don't mean to call General Hurley incompetent. I just don't think he fully understood. But can you tell us about the Dixie mission and some of these other smaller missions that occurred, the Double Ten Agreement? And it just kind of summarize some of those, and then we can talk about, like, well, why did those fail? Okay, so – Let's yeah, we mentioned the Dixie mission. Let's let's talk about that just a little bit and, and start talking about John S. Service. Because that's a good, you know, I'm sure our listeners might be like, well, I've been told McCarthy made everything up. Let, well, let's talk about John S. Service. Um he's kind of a minor, minor figure in the larger McCarthyism debate, but he was a key figure in the loss of China debate. And John S. Service participated in this thing called the Dixie Mission. Uh, which in 1945, I believe, uh, State Department employees and uh, uh, Army guys, uh, I think the, it was a Colonel Barrett, I believe, from the U.S. Army, they kind of led this team of like 20-ish people um, to go and visit Mao in northern China uh, to investigate, like, are they good guys? Are they bad guys? Can well, we trust them? Started, Can we not trust they them? They started arriving in 44. 44. Okay, thank you. Uh, and they the whole point was, hey, if we really want to beat the Japanese in China, we've only been liaising with Chiang Kai-shek and the KMT. We're noticing the communists are gaining power, particularly in northern China, which is the power base of China, by the way. Um, not only, and, and not only that, mind you, the Japanese, it, we start winning in the islands. Um, we start gaining a lot of ground. But 
on the mainland of China, the, the Japanese launched Operation Ichigo, which was mm. basically a campaign, and they almost almost took China over. Yeah. Um, so we got real nervous, and that. Yeah. So I did want to make that point. So it's the communists no, right. are coming, and the Japanese are coming. Yeah. We're, so we're in a tricky spot. We were very concerned uh, in forty four and forty five about China capitulating. So we were like, hey, we should we start giving weapons to the CCP in Mao? So there was the Stixie mission that went to go see. John S. Service, who's a State Department employee, was a part of this Dixie mission. Long story short, the conclusion of this Dixie mission was, oh, Mao and the communists, they're not really bad communists. They're more like European socialists. We can totally mm-hmm. trust them. They, they are way more competent, way better fighters, way better leadership structure than the KMT. These guys are awesome. We need to give them money. We need to give them weapons. We need to help these guys out as much as we can. That was the conclusion of the Dixie mission, which, by the way, I was not able to find why it was called the Dixie mission. <laughs> so if anybody can help us help me out, Colin, I don't know if you saw that. I couldn't find why it was called the Dixie mission. So if anybody wants to help us, I would appreciate that. That goes back to the Roosevelt turned Truman administration and everybody's hunky dory. Well, fast forward to when the communists took over and we start questioning how on earth did the communists take over? One of the key things that started getting scrutinized was the Dixie mission. And people and Republicans started peeling back the onion of like, how did this happen? Well, they started second guessing the people who went on the Dixie mission and come to find out this guy named John S. Service. Long story short here, this is actually a fascinating episode. John S. Service was giving the locations of KMT uh, forces to the CCP. And he was doing that. This was all classified information, by the way. He was passing classified information to the KMT through an American journal called Amerasia. This American journal was purported to be like, this is Americans talking about Asia. But for, for those of y'all that are interested in like spy history, journal uh, newspapers and journalists in particular were like the favorite cover for spies to use because it was natural for journalists to be asking questions like, oh, I'm just writing an article for my paper. You know, the spy would use the cover of a journalist and be like, oh, like, where's everybody at? Where are you doing? How long are you staying? When are you leaving? Like, Can I follow you? Can I be embedded with you? Yeah, Exactly. So journalists were pretty, in newspaper and magazines, very common during the Cold War to be used as spy fronts and, and means to conduct espionage. Amerasia. I, I didn't see that Amerasia was a spy front. Rather, I just saw that John S. Service was giving Amerasia KMT troop dispositions, and Amerasia was then turning it over to the, the CCP. Um, John S. Service was accused on like three different occasions for being a communist. McCarthy had it out for him. Uh, and he actually beat the charges formally later on into like the 60s and the 70s. He ended up formally beating the charges un- until it became known. I don't think he was ever – I don't think he ever spent a day in jail. But it was later found out, and I think he died, um, that he was in fact passing classified KMT troop positions, which if we recall, the Chinese communists were very interested in this in this kind of information. They were attacking and being attacked by the KMT the whole time they were fighting the Japanese. So, of course, so if we take it for granted that John S. Service was at a minimum a sympathizer <laughs> to communism, right? Then, of then maybe he's a little biased when this Dixie mission writes this report saying the communists are great. The communist, like we should totally, we should give them money and weapons, like blah 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 blah. So. That's that's kind of how the Dixie mission kind of relates to McCarthyism, the loss of China dynamics, etc. Two things real quick um, for the Dixie mission, as far as the name, uh, John Davies wrote a book called Dragon by the Tail, and he kind of speculates that 
it was called the Dixie Mission because it had a lot of Southerners that were part of the mission, and it took place in quote unquote rebel held communist territory. So it just kind of felt natural mm. to code it as the Dixie Mission. That's what he said. Hmm. That might be where they got it from. Very sure. reputable, reputable source. Two, I think obviously John S. Service, that's not good passing uh, classified documents like that to potential enemies. But, you know, another thing I think that kind of clouded the judgment, the American liaison who was there advising Chiang Kai-shek hated him. So they were getting reports from Stilwell about how he hated the KMT and he thought that they were poorly led. Anyway, we've talked about that ad nauseum. But also, if you look at the tactics and the strategy of, of Mao, they actually hadn't been in a conflict since like the 100 Regiment Battle, the Battle of the 100 Regiments, or, and that was in 1941. Ever since then, they had been using guerrilla tactics, surrounding the Japanese, giving up the, the – you've talked about it a ton – the strategic with retreat, doing things like that where they were – just constantly a nuisance to the Japanese. And it actually won them a lot of favor with the people because they appeared to be more successful. They weren't losing nearly as many soldiers um, in these conflicts. And it didn't, the morale, they didn't lose as much morale because they didn't lose as many soldiers. They didn't require as much equipment. The Japanese were just drained. So it kind of gave the illusion that they were doing much better than the KMT. And there's a there's a lot of different uh, competing scholarship on, well, who is actually more effective, who is doing more real fighting. But I have to, you know, looking at the evidence of the, you know, the, the Dixie mission, what they came out with and some of what Stilwell was saying and some of these other um, members of the Dixie mission, it seems like that was a real strat that was also a successful strategy by Mao. It's like, Hey, we're just not going to lose. We just won't lose. And it'll give the appearance that we're doing really well. Right. Yeah. And we're going to make this as painful as possible for the Japanese. And they did. They made it very painful. And they continued that into the Civil War. It's actually really interesting. He, This idea of a strategic retreat that we go back to, Mao actually viewed cities as a burden because to occupy a city requires a lot of logistical support. It's not like you're actually able, you know, the supplies, if you leave, if you empty a city of its supplies, it's not like it you can just take food. You have to grow food from the country, food from the countryside. You have to supply the troops that occupy the city. You have people in the city. You have to defend the city. So Mao would just be like, all right, you guys can have the city. Shanghai or Shanghai Shek, you now have the burden of owning that city. We're just going to withdraw to the countryside, live off the land, and you're going to have to come and get us. And he would make these great retreats and give up all this land. And then Chiang Kai-shek would be unable to hold it because it required so much logistical support, which he didn't really have. and was not, it's not like they had a, the infrastructure they have now. So then he would have to withdraw and suddenly Mao comes right back in and he's taking it back. So he'd make these huge withdrawals and then these huge gains. And it just, the, you know, it, again, it just people, it was really, really demoralizing for the KMT. So every time the KMT would, would withdraw, they would lose more and more soldiers to the CCP. Like it was almost a daily occurrence that there would be. And so then they would start conscripting soldiers from the countryside and they didn't like that one bit. And it was like, Hey, you can either, you can either, um, you know, so if you can defect and join the CCP or you can go, you know, or you can, uh, support them. Or if you, um, or want to quit or anything like that, they're just going to come beat you and then put you back into the army if they find out you escaped. So, you know, I just think it's really the strategic withdrawal was really effective both in World War II and the Civil War. I definitely think you're right. And it again, it, it goes back to M Mao was able to mobilize the masses. And in China, especially at that time, this and that was and this is more true then than it is now. China primarily consisted of rural agrarian uh, farmers, right? The China had large urban cities, but it's hard to fathom, you know, just the sheer amount of uh, lower class work, you know, workers that existed in China. And that's exactly who supported Mao. And just by sheer numbers alone, um, you know, the remainder of the war, like you said, he was able to win. Like he, uh, Chiang Kai-shek controlled the cities, he controlled the countryside, and the countryside had just more people and more support and was able to uh, to go from there. 
you know, Jay, after talking about this and kind of the idea that Mao really just won the people over it, it goes back to, did the U S lose China in it? And to some, to some of what the Chinese scholars were saying, it's like, well, China was never yours to lose. It was never yours. It, it's almost kind of like we talk about, did the Marshall mission fail? You know, did the Dixie mission fail? What, what was the, you know, was this incompetence? Yes to all of those, but those were doomed to fail from the beginning. Like they were never going to be successful. Like the Truman administration, really the Roosevelt, then the Truman administration were never going to be successful because they needed to take a much, the time to get involved in China and to prevent the spread of communism would have been the twenties. The Soviets did something really, <laughs> really effectively. Yeah. And I, we talked about this in a previous episode with, um, they exported communism immediately after the Bolshevik revolution to other parts of the world. And China was one of the places that because it was such in such a disarray, remember the warlord era coming out of Yuan Shikai, it was the perfect breeding ground for, you know, coming off the century of humiliation. They were, it was a breeding ground for communism and it made a lot of sense. It was perfect. The U S at that point was looking at it from a business perspective. Business is good. We're okay. The communists came in there and they, infiltrated with very, because remember, Chiang Kai-shek was also um, sympathetic to some of the communists, some of the communist causes. The, the Soviets looked at him very favorably until the Shanghai massacre. Mao, Sun Yat-sen was too. That's when they should have gotten involved to try and influence these key people, but they they didn't. The Soviets did, and it, it's a fascinating topic. We talked about it with Mikhail Borodin and his influence in the early 20s on Sun Yat-sen, but I think that Getting involved in the really the late 30s, 40s, it was too late. Like the damage had already been done. The, the CCP was already a very effective, well-oiled machine at that point, And it was only going to grow. Like it, if you were going to look at it in cancer terminology, it was already terminal at that point. It, it, it had, uh, it was malignant. It, it had spread. Yeah. No, you're, you're, I agree with you 100%. And it's kind of funny that McCarthy and Republicans were blaming the Democrats for like helping the communists, either intentionally or unintentionally, when, when in fact it was the Soviets <laughs> who were, uh, what an interesting anecdote, not going to go too far down this road, but the Soviets took over Manchuria at the, at the tail end of world war two. Whooped the which, Japanese there. Yeah. Like, it was like I saw something like seven hundred thousand Japanese soldiers surrendered to the Soviets. Like it was very quick, very ugly, very the Manchuria uh, campaign uh, for Russia, um, and which that's what we mentioned uh, last episode when it talked about why Japan surrendered. Uh, it may or may not have been the atomic bomb. It may have been the Russians invading Manchuria, but um, you can listen to our previous episode for on uh, d- discussion on that one. Uh, but the Soviets were taking those Japanese weapons caches that they, uh, had captured and they were giving them to the CCP and Mao. They were like, oh, well, they're already right here. We've basically already beat Germany or no, we had in fact already beat Germany. Um, take all the weapons. They're already here. So like. It was a, it was a race to get those resources. It was interesting. Like the KMT and the CCP were like trying to race into Manchuria to get those weapons. And the Soviets basically wouldn't allow the KMT to get them, even though with the Roosevelt administration implored them not to give them to the CCP, they did it anyway. Yeah. They just kind of let them come and take it. And if I could perhaps oversimplify why the communists beat the KMT in the civil war, it was because Mao had already successfully established a power base in northern China, which which I would argue is the power base of China on the whole. But he had basically gained a majority foothold in northern China. So like think Beijing, Shandong Peninsula, uh, uh, Chang'an area. Uh, and the Russians – more or less turned over Manchuria to the CCP. It it wasn't this clean turnover. The KMT did contest them there. There was fighting, etc. But through Russian support, 
the communists were able to take over Manchuria, they already had northern China. And by that point, it was just a – it was a fait accompli. It was – Chiang Kai-shek's power base was in the south, in Nanking and in Guangzhou area, and that's just not the power base of China. And it was just a matter of time for Mao and the communists, once they had Manchuria, to just push them down and out, which is exactly what happened. Yeah, and you look at the final years of the war, it's almost just this slow and methodical – well, not, sometimes slow, but there was some great leaps and bounds that, that Mao made, but you just – you just look at the army size. It, it literally just reverses. I mean, it goes from, you know, I think at the end of World War II, there were like one, just over a million communist soldiers, CCP soldiers, and it goes to 4.3. And you see, you know, you just see it switch because there are so many defections. Like, Chiang Kai-shek would lose territory because he would just lose an army. He would just lose a regiment. People would just, Overnight, they would just leave and go join the CCP and defect. It was so rapid that I think it's, A, you can't blame him. B, you can't really blame the U.S. at that point because they weren't involved. It was it was a matter of time. Yeah. I think we forget that it's not necessarily winning or losing battles that causes you to win or lose a war. You can – I mean, from the American standpoint, Vietnam is the is the quintessential example of this. But like – it's not about the battles as much as it's there's other factors. Popular support that we've talked about is is probably the big one. So, you know what? I think this was a, a really in depth episode. We talked about a lot of different topics, and it was kind of a different format. So, more question and answer, and looking at some of these questions. And we hope you enjoyed it. Um, for our listeners out there, if you did, give us some some constructive criticism, some feedback. We love to have it. A five star rating is always appreciated due to the. The algorithm. If you want, you can follow Jay and I on social media. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Help us get the word out on the loins of history, and we do appreciate it. And come back next week as we talk more about uh, getting into the Korean War and the Cold War era of the 50s um, in the history of U.S. and Chinese relations. Thank you again from the loins of history. We'll see you next week. Music.